All right, the day is here. We get to finally talk about performance when it comes to Intel's 12th gen. This is one of those like, where do you start kind of a deals. We are used to Intel over the last four or five generations just being completely non-innovative, just building upon their 14 nanometer process that they just couldn't get past for the longest time. And then they started adding all these pluses, trying to fool you into thinking it was a new process. Well, AMD just continued to innovate and move along and improve their IPC and improve their process and improve their core count and keep the pricing comparative and at least competitive and taking back a huge chunk of market share. Well, Intel ain't having it this time because the 12th gen, they brought the fight back to AMD. Okay, so a few things to talk about in performance here. This is one of those tests that there's about 5 million different ways you could run these because of the fact that Alder Lake's specific scheduler only works with Windows 11. So as we've already talked about before, the architecture is very different versus anything you've seen in the past from, from Intel regarding their mainstream CPUs. It's the L LGA 1700 socket. It's got more pins, it's a bigger processor. We've already covered the physical changes. We've talked about the fact that you're gonna have to um, either have the motherboard that has the oblong hole so that you can run the older coolers or get a new bracket for your newer coolers because they are slightly wider. When it comes to the specifics though of the cores, the P cores versus the E cores, essentially it's like two different CPUs on the same substrate. Although they are not like connecting, well they are connecting through a fabric. It's funny how they all use the term fabric, but they are connecting through an interconnect and a fabric. You essentially have one eight core, 16 thread, hyper threading CPU, very similar to like an 11900K that you're used to seeing. And we also have eight E cores, which are, which are efficiency cores, which are smaller, they're slower, they're not as fast, their IPC is not as good, but they're perfect for low power consumption, low uh, priority tasks. So if you have background tasks and stuff running on your system, they can handle that while your P cores are, are available to handle more intensive tasks. Basically working in tandem with each other. The problem is the only way that they can communicate and know what core handles what is either by the CPU assigning, which is what you get with Windows 10, by the way, we are doing today's test with Windows 10, or Windows 11 scheduler directly tying in with the CPU working in conjunction between what the CPU is suggesting, what Windows is suggesting, and then it takes the best uh, possible outcome between the two, and then we'll assign them dynamically, where you could actually have something running on a P core, and then you have a higher priority task take over, and it can move that task to the E core, and then the new task comes on the P core, and it all happens very seamlessly. The problem with Windows 10 is that logic is not nearly as clean, I, I, I wanna say. And the reason why we're testing on Windows 10 first, and we'll be doing Windows 11 as well, because this architecture truly requires Windows 11 to see its full potential in terms of the efficiency and P core, E core handoff is because we know many, many people have still not upgraded to Windows 11. If you guys are like me, I usually wait until at least the first major content or, or upgrade patch or update patch. They used to call them service packs back in the day and I'm, you know, whatever. <clears throat> I'm one of those people that waits to make sure everything's ironed out. There's no weird issues with programs or I'm gonna install it and suddenly OBS doesn't work and then my live streams are screwed up and actually there was a Windows 11 OBS problem. I think that's been fixed. Windows 10 more closely resembles what our users that are watching this video or our viewers are gonna be experiencing. So we're gonna start off with answering the question, can you upgrade to 12th gen Intel without moving to Windows 11. I don't wanna say upgrade. I don't always feel like the next OS is an upgrade. I don't personally feel that way. So in terms of specs, there's a couple ways that we did this. The ASUS motherboards have a lot of logic built in automatically that can either do AI optimization or overclocking, their own limits when it comes to the Intel turbo boost and the thermal velocity boost and all that sort of stuff. You can override those, you can extend them, you can delete them all together. So for the first test that we did on the 12900K, which is the one we're specifically focusing on today, we have a 12900K and a 12600K is out of the box settings with Intel limits applied. Out of the box with AM, uh, the Asus motherboard, specifically the Maximus Z690 Hero, which we're using here, does automatically do an auto optimization where it's let the BIOS decide, is specifically what the setting is called. I don't want that to obviously interfere with any of our Intel settings because Intel, we're, we're testing the CPU settings here, not the motherboard's capability of interfering with any of those um, experiences. So we've disabled all those settings. We are stuck with the Intel limits, the in Intel turbo timer, the Intel thermal velocity boost, all that stuff. We are running a 360 AIO right here from Fractal Design. It is using the old bracket because this motherboard does support the older cooler, so that's nice. 
It is running uh, Kingpin KPX Extreme uh, thermal paste. And the fans are pretty much set to full speed because they're not that loud and I usually just leave them at full speed. We are running the Dominator from Corsair, the Dominator Platinum Special Edition 5200 megahertz dims. The interesting thing about this is I believe the timings were 38, 38, 38, 84, which is funny because we don't exactly know yet how that's gonna calculate with DDR5 versus DDR4. Like those timings on DDR4 would be awful. Like that would be so awful. But on DDR5 running 5200 megahertz, who knows, which is what these are. These are also two 32 gigabyte sticks. So we have 64 gigabytes of RAM sitting in this system with two slots still available to us. So we also compared this to the AMD 5900X, also on an Asus motherboard, also with the out of the box settings because of the fact that AMD also does have those let BIOS optimize, let BIOS decide type of features in terms of trying to uplift performance when it comes to uh, AMD. So we are running the AMD out of the box settings on the 5900X. Now the reason why I chose the 5900X is because it, it is the closest competitor in terms of cost to the 12900K. Now here's the problem with cost, the pandemic. You guys already know that, cost is crazy. So Intel's own ARC page puts the suggested price or the recommended customer price at 589 to 599 for this CPU. So essentially $600. The 5900X from AMD is also all over the place. I recently bought one actually on Amazon um, and they are currently $570. So there's about a $20 to $30 price difference. The problem is, depending on where you shop for the 12900K, because it's brand new, the pricing's everywhere. Like Micro Center has it pre-order slash, you know, because it doesn't actually go on sale yet until you guys see this video. So at the time of making it, it's not available on shelves yet. They have a price of $649. So it's already a $50 markup at Micro Center. Um, that's probably one of the best prices you're gonna find. So we've got a, about an $80 swing here. Now the thing is I could have spent uh, another $125 or $150 or so and compared it to the, seven, or the 5950X. I think we'll do that test in another video because I want to try and keep this as closely comparative as I can with the price. Price is where we like to zero in on our comparisons, not like core for core. Although ironically, they both have 24 threads. The 5900X is a 12 core, 24 thread uh, CPU. Full size cores, SMT on all 12 of those cores give you full 24 threads. Whereas the 12900K, right, it's eight core, 16 thread P cores, so hyper threading on those, plus eight E cores, which have no hyper threading and they're slower. So it'll be really interesting to compare 24 to 24. Now the third line item you're gonna notice on the charts is we let the motherboard, motherboard go ahead and handle how it wants to handle the Intel uh, CPU. There's AI optimizations and stuff that are available to Intel and we went ahead and turned those on because we wanted to see what kind of uplift that we would get. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the charts to see how these two compared. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at those charts together right now and let's preface this with the fact that the only fanboy I am is a fanboy of performance. I don't care if it's AMD, I don't care if it's Intel. No matter, no matter what, people are gonna say this video is biased in some way and I really don't care. The numbers are what they are, we show them. This time around, Intel, at this price point, because I, I have no doubt the 5950X is going to match, if not beat, this CPU, but it also has significantly more threads to do it. It's also a significantly more expensive CPU, so it should do that. This time it, it, it literally kicked the 5900X like it, like it was a school bully on the, on the playground and stole AMD's lunch money while it was at it. I'm, I'm, 
It's good to see the competition back from Intel because we've not seen anything innovative from them in a long time. This is probably gonna also give uh, motivation for AMD to come out with something new. I mean, I believe the next gen process is supposed to be coming out in the next few months for AMD and that's just speculatory based on some of the leaks and rumor mills I've been hearing. But let's hope that they can obviously start, let's hope that they can surpass in Intel again and we'll get this nice leapfrog effect where everyone's winning by seeing performance go up with hopefully the price point staying around the same. Now there is an anomaly on there we have to talk about. If you guys noticed when it came to handbrake, the Intel was significantly slower and the overclock setting was even slower than the out of the box. There's a really weird anomaly that we haven't been able to figure out. We think it specifically has to do with the scheduler on Windows 10. Only the E cores were being hit when it came to transcoding that 1080p video, which is just under 10 minute video up to 4K. So it was, a, it was an upscale transcode from 1080 to 4K. And obviously with the SMT and full size cores and standard architecture with AMD, it had no problems running that. It was very quick, very easy. We were seeing very anomalous behavior from Intel. In fact, the first time I ran the test, the P cores would activate for about 20 seconds and then they would turn off and the E cores would stay fully loaded. Like all 16 threads or all 16 cores would completely load and then you'd see all the P cores drop out. When I overclocked it and I ran the test again, the P cores never turned on during the transcode after that. They just immediately would stay off. We thought maybe it was either the thermal uh, velocity boost or maybe power limits or something that was keeping it from actually hitting all the cores because handbrake transcoding can actually be pretty hard on a CPU, especially when we're using, using H.264 software encoding. Um, yeah, we, we firmly believe that if we were on Windows 11, that the scheduler would have handled it just fine and it would have loaded them all up. So that's an example though of something you might experience if you grab cutting edge, bleeding edge technology and you're using it with software that isn't optimized for it yet when there's an entirely different way that the process is supposed to be handled when it comes to divvying out the, the workloads. So that's something worth mentioning. And that's one of the reasons why I want to start on Windows 10 was because I was looking for that sort of stuff. Another weird issue that we encountered is the fact that 3 d Mark refuses to boot on this system. If I were to click 3D Mark right now, it would say initializing, I'm gonna bring up the logo, and if I monitor the processes, it just quits. But the splash screen doesn't go away, it just sits there thinking indefinitely and it never goes away. Even if you shut down Steam, the splash screen stays up. So there's something weird right now with, these are the latest Windows 10 updates, there's, there's updates we can get without going to 11. BIOS updated, .NET framework completely uh, updated, everything, I could find about trying to fix this problem wouldn't work. So I don't know if this is a problem with the CPU not being recognized by 3D Mark because it's technically not out yet. So it was some weird of initialization process. Works fine on AMD. It works fine on every other Intel system that we have, just not this one. So I wanted to do the Time Spy CPU test and the Firestrike CPU test because they're just two different types of AVX sort of tests to, to see how they compare. Just looking for numbers that we can compare with each other. As long as you run the same test on two different systems, that's a comparison, comparison that you can you know, rate against each other. So that wasn't working. Um, interestingly enough, hardware monitor works, reads all the sensors, gives me all the core temps and stuff. And let's go ahead and talk about temps right now. If I open up hardware monitor, and I'll just read these out to you. There's no way Phil's gonna be able to focus on this sideways. Um, it takes a second for hardware monitor to boot. But once it does, we actually get all of our sensors to show. Now voltages, we were seeing 1.445 volts with the overclock applied. And I was seeing about 1.373 without the overclock supplied. The funny thing about that is the temperatures were extremely reasonable. Now in terms of clock speeds too, and we'll do this with Cinebench, because Cinebench can usually hit the CPU pretty hard right away, giving us a, a lot of heat initially built into the CPU. We'll see up to 1.445 volts in the P-Core and E-Core during full load like this, and the temperatures stay ridiculously cool. I have no doubt we're gonna see 1.5 plus volts on hardcore overclocks, um, but the new process here is obviously, whatever, whatever the material they're using between the, uh, the top of the die and the heat spreader is clearly getting the heat out of the CPU because that voltage, 1.445 on like a 10900K or an 11900K, that would be hot. You'd have a hard time with even a 360 AIO to keep that cool. But that's absolutely no problems here. So our E cores right now are going up to 4.1 gigahertz on single core thread and up to 5.4 gigahertz single core on the P core. Now that's the AI overclock right there. So if I go ahead right now and I just start here the multi-core, our package temp is at 70C 
and our cores are sitting, so the E cores are sitting in the upper 50s, and then we are sitting in upper 60s, lower 70s on our P cores, and our voltage right now is 1.368. So it's actually lower than, see there's 1.445, which we were seeing under idle. So this is part of the V droop, which is fine. Yeah, so if we go ahead and take a look at our speeds, 5.1 all core, 3.8 all core, that's part of the overclock. And there's a score right there, which is a 28,638. So Phil's CPU, which is 3970, was over like 40,000. But I just wanted to tell you the temperatures on that, which of course, you know, the coolant will get hot over time. Uh, maxed out at 74 on the package. I've not seen it go over 80, and I did have this test initially running this morning on the loop test, because it does have a loop setting where it just keep going. It never got hotter than 80 on a 360 AIO with an overclock. Um, the other thing worth mentioning here too is the fact that uh, right now it's idling in the low 20s. 18C on the P cores right now, 18, uh, I mean, it's just, to me, it's crazy, because I'm used to seeing Intel be hot. Intel was like the new, bulldozer meme, if you will. Remember how hot bulldozer and FX got? It's like Intel had become the new heat meme and now everything's changing. So yeah, if you are the kind of person that is all about CPU and you do CPU related tasks, as long as it's not handbrake on Windows 10, at least with our particular setup, then this is a setup you have to consider. It's not cheap. It is absolutely not cheap whatsoever. But if the 12900K tells us anything about how it compares price comparatively with AMD, the 12600K being significantly cheaper means it's gonna bring some awesome competition to that more entry level upper end market. The entry level high end, if you will. Cause remember every bracket has its entry level and that's where the 12600 is gonna be. So I'm looking forward to testing that one. Anyway guys, look forward to some future videos on this. We're gonna be talking about specifically game performance. The single core performance on this, absolutely bonkers. A 2020 stock setting and a 2089 on R23. If you look once again at this chart of how it compared to the 5900X single core performance, which remember was completely decimating the 10900K, it, it, it just, it's crazy to see that level of IPC improvement from Intel in one generation. So that means one of two things here. They really pulled out a, a, a rabbit out of their hat between the 11900K and now, or they've been sitting on this for a while and finally launched it. I'm inclined to think it's probably a mixture of both. They've been working on this for a while, but they finally launched it with the timing being right um, to, compare, to, to compete with AMD. So this is where you guys sound off below. Is this enough to bring you back to Team Intel if you were buying or building a new system right now? Or would you stick with AMD at this point because Intel's had their chance and regardless of the performance you're seeing now, you've already made up your mind, you'd go with Team Red. This is all hypothetical, of course. I don't think anybody with any high-end system should buy new parts to switch to this. It'd be very little upgrade depending on what you've got. So we'll do 5950X versus this soon. We'll do Windows 11, we'll do gaming performance because obviously with the increased IPC in the 3090s, I think we might actually see uh, a gaming uplift over something like uh, 5900X or 5950 by switching to Intel, especially on high FPS games or 1440p FPS. So what kind of tests do you guys wanna see? Sound off in the comments below. Let us know what games you want us to run and who deserves your money. Thanks for watching guys. As always, we'll see you in the next one. See how fast that shuts down?